You're good to start, Chris. Great, thank you. I was just seeing the numbers uh, of participants this meeting come up, but uh, welcome to our college webinar this evening. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Great. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Chris O'Loughlin. I'm head of school in the east of England. And I'm delighted to be talking about training over the next uh, kind of hour with Luke Baker, the chair of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee at the college, and Sadia Alvi, who's the PTC International Medical Graduate Rep. Uh, so we'll be talking each for about probably about 15 minutes or so each and allowing time for questions at the end. If you have questions, please put them in the question and answer uh, box at the bottom of your Zoom panel rather than the chat box, otherwise we might miss them. And uh, we'll try and uh, answer as many as we can at the end. But hopefully this will give you a chance to uh, maybe quiz members of the PTC and possibly myself about matters related to training. Um, so what uh, joins these presentations together is an idea of personalised training, and I'll talk a bit about that myself as we're going through. Um, so I'll be uh, giving a bit of background to that, which is a kind of uh, philosophy, I suppose, we've adopted in the east of England to drive our training programmes forward. Uh, but part of that is very much training involvement, which is why I'm particularly keen that most of the time this afternoon will be given over to trainees themselves. So Luke and then Sadia talking about trainees priorities uh, from the PTC side. And then Sadia talking particularly about su uh, supporting our international medical graduates and introducing a new guide that will be uh, should be launching soon. Uh, so I work in Cambridge. I'm actually a general adult uh, psychiatrist for most of the time, not actually covering Cambridge, but covering Ely in the Fens, just north of Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge, a beautiful town looking a bit like this under better circumstances. Uh, and then there I've been a training programme director and then director of medical education, but more recently uh, head of school where we look after the regional training programmes. Uh, one of the things I do with Health Education England as, as well as that is I work with their professional support and wellbeing service. So I see trainees who are struggling in training for quite a wide variety of reasons uh, across specialties to try to help, help them through training and achieve the outcome they desire. And I think that's fed into the, the ethos we've got in the East of England in psychiatry training uh, about really making it count for trainees in a way that's meaningful for them. And we call it personalised training, really drawing on two aspects of uh, personalised medicine. Uh, and there are two slightly separate strands to that. Uh, so the first uh, that you will likely be familiar with is uh, a kind of person-centered care. So this would be applied to clinical practice often and would include quite a holistic look at, for clinical practice, the patient uh, in front of you and their abilities and interests and values and goals. And associated with person-centered care would be quite a few uh, features, again, you'll be familiar with, such as shared decision-making, uh, a focus on the person in front of you, uh, empowering them to achieve what they want and make decisions appropriate, and uh, particularly aspects of kindness, which is possibly a theme we'll come to when we talk about training a bit. Uh, of course, it also includes co-production, so in clinical services with our patients, uh, and we'll talk possibly briefly about how that might apply to training. So that'd be one side of maybe personalised medicine. And the other side, of course, is rather different and perhaps, if you like, more scientific rather than humanistic. And that would be how to apply the results of our, our knowledge base and research to individuals rather than groups. And that could be through preventative measures or diagnosis or treatment, but how to really pin down what works on an individual basis rather than treating people very much the same. Now, in terms of training, Obviously, we're quite bound to an apprenticeship model uh, across the whole of medicine, and that has lots of advantages. It's very practical, of course. You learn uh, while you're on the job, uh, you know, on the ground, so to speak, with experience and gradually build up your confidence, and already has built into it this strong relationship between trainer and trainee through an apprenticeship approach. Uh, 
and is is tried and tested perhaps would be the best way of saying it rather than necessarily evidence-based but does have some disadvantages in that it can be a bit passive potentially you're very much dependent on what comes up uh, slow to change and doesn't necessarily address all the areas uh, that trainees might want or need so i'm certainly not saying that personalized training as an ethos um, undermines or removes or is an alternative to apprenticeship models in training but I would say this combination of an evidence-based approach to training combined with holistically thinking about trainees needs very much supplements the training we do. Now I'm aware uh, as you've tuned in you're going to be fairly interested in training already and there's always a danger of, of uh, explaining things that people already do so in, in some ways I'm not saying this is anything uh, new but perhaps provides a, a context and framework. So if we think about how that might work, so uh, these were aspirations from the uh, supported and valued document that the PTC produced a few years back. Uh, so enhanced junior doctor forums would to some extent be the equivalent of that co-production where trainees are very involved in how their training is run within trusts uh, and obviously within deaneries through the representation we have in the School of Psychiatry. Uh, but looking perhaps then particularly at ARCPs and career autonomy. So ARCPs are really seen as rather distant, actually geographically distant, particularly at the moment, but often anyway, uh, and rather a tick box exercise with little individual feedback and poorly connected to training. So in fact, ARCPs manage the considerable achievement of seeing seeming both irrelevant and anxiety provoking simultaneously. Uh, and to illustrate that uh, in a rather poor example, I'm afraid, uh, from my own region a few years back, I came across this when I was looking through a trainee's portfolio. This, this is an outcome four form, so someone's reached the end of core training because of exams. Uh, and the panel hasn't written anything else, actually. So they haven't written anything about all the achievements the trainee has done over the previous three and a half years, uh, anything that might have affected their training, what their future steps were, uh, any advice about the future. Uh, and that really makes me quite, well, sad, maybe a little bit angry, uh, that trainees aren't recognised in an individual way and more appropriately. So we have been working on this. Uh, so we produced some uh, guidelines for ARCPs from the college following support and value to make them more harmonised across the country. And this year I was involved in the COVID-19 arrangements for ARCPs, which I was uh, quite, quite pleased. I'm willing to hear feedback about that, but hope they were sufficiently flexible that trainees felt supported and there was that element of, of kindness in terms of recognizing the very hard work our trainees have been doing uh, through this pandemic and making sure that their progression in training wasn't penalized. So ARCP is also career flexibility and opportunities. So as people move through training, there are a myriad of opportunities that arise and decisions that need to be taken in terms of directions. And within that, then people will perhaps move into the community or an acute hospital or inpatient and perhaps specialise in biological areas of psychiatry or move more towards social aspects. Many of our trainees will move part time, so there'll be decisions about that. And then what areas they might want to focus on in terms of developing skills in clinical management or education or research or leadership or a whole range of things. And of course, we need to not only equip our trainees for what they're doing uh, now, but really what's going to happen over the next five or 10 years uh, or even beyond. Um, so how trainees develop and the opportunities available to them are really critical and will be very much individual to their own wishes. So we need to make sure the posts are available for that. We sometimes struggle with some posts. We've managed to maintain substance misuse posts in the East of England through some close working with third sector organisations. We can be uh, really quite rigid in, in, rec in how we recognise what skills people have uh, so I've had some quite uh, difficult conversations recently with people moving into psychiatry training who have considerable experience already, but because of the way they've come into psychiatry training, it's quite hard to recognise that in the structures we have. And likewise, less than full-time training and perhaps particularly interdenary transfers, uh, I see families really torn apart by not being able to be in the same area, perhaps as their, their partner, but also uh, if they've got caring responsibilities for their wider family. So there are um, considerable difficulties that we impose on trainees. Uh, so I talked a, a bit about that strand of personalised training. I just want to talk a little bit about evidence-based learning, perhaps moving towards thinking of exams. Uh, I came across uh, this 
So there isn't a great deal of evidence in education, but there is some, uh, one of which is the use of highlighters as a revision technique does not work. Uh, so not only does it not work, it possibly makes things worse. My own, let's say, revision books are, are largely based like that. But there is evidence on what does work that we should be sharing with our trainees, particularly as we know exams are a major stumbling block uh, for trainees, of which repeated testing comes out uh, top, really. So in terms of evidence-based studying, repeated testing and mixing your, the subjects you're learning have strong evidence behind them. Interestingly, trying to summarise information uh, teaches you how to summarise, but not necessarily much beyond that. And there are ways of doing uh, spaced repetition, particularly spaced repetition testing, to really um, supplement people's learning. There are plenty of apps available to do this that we should probably be using now instead of uh, written out smart cards. That's a symbol for my favourite but slightly nerdy one called Anki which is uh, incredibly flexible uh, and far better if you create your own smart cards. But I've been doing that. I've been trying to learn Italian over the last couple of years. Uh, now have a set of about 4,000 cards that something you'd never be able to carry around uh, that sits on my phone and I can do on a, on a regular basis to build up my vocabulary. But exams are a struggle for some of our trainees, particularly our international medical graduates. Uh, and it's easy to get behind on exams because there isn't much time in core training. So three years, three and a half years with some remedial time. And if you want to give yourself a couple of sittings at the cask, you really need to be completing a written paper, ideally before the end of CT1 or just into CT2, or you will start running out of time. And that's a challenge for people coming new to the NHS and into the psychiatry training, certainly compared with people who may have known they were going to do psychiatry and started their paper A in foundation years here. Uh, now, I'm not actually going to talk any more about differential attainment myself, uh, not to you, I'm, I'm going to talk to it uh, at some length tomorrow to the Eastern Division Conference, uh, because I'm very uh, keen that Sadia talks about differential attainment from a trainee perspective uh, and what we can do there. So in thinking about personalised training, it's very much led by the trainee, but going to be facilitated by the supervisor. And the amount of facilitation and support is going to vary a lot according to where the trainee is in training, how much they uh, understand the NHS systems, the requirements of the curriculum, uh, and so on. So that will vary, but uh, should ultimately be led by the trainee and should include, and we're not very good at this, a personalised development plan that helps plan proactively uh, aspects of learning that trainees want to experience. So that when I'm doing my general adult clinic, I'm happy seeing patients who are referred to, to me with whatever problem they've got. But if I've got a trainee who needs particular experiences, that's very easy to accommodate if I know about it in advance. Now, this should be fairly straightforward because one of the things we do do well in psychiatry is we have good relationship with our supervisors. So supportive seniors and supervision always comes out very highly uh, whether it's the GMC looking at it on our trainee survey or supported and valued through the PTC. Uh, so that is an incredibly strong position for psychiatry training to move forward from. And that's obviously recently been combined with uh, perhaps a recognition of the trainer role from the GMC, uh, which sometimes perhaps seems a little bureaucratic, but does allow for educational appraisal so that every year myself and all the other trainers in, in the country are sitting down and thinking about how they're doing as a trainer. Uh, and that, again, gives us a powerful springboard to improve the quality of our training. Uh, continuing with personalised training, uh, so a slight pop cultural reference maybe, uh, for people who play computer games, there is something called min-maxing, where you minimise essentially unnecessary activities or things that are not going to improve your skills and do what you can to maximise the desired attributes. So some video game players will be very familiar with this kind of approach. Not that you don't want well-rounded people to some extent, but following an individual course is going to be quite important. And similarly, getting feedback that is appropriate for you. So you may well be familiar with Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, and that does require knowledge of the trainee by the trainer so that feedback can be appropriately delivered. And then uh, scaffolding, as is uh, they're applied so that trainees can um, gradually improve in confidence and demonstrate greater skills. 
So you might think, for example, of a post, and I, I, we could probably all think of posts where someone starts off under fairly close supervision and gradually does more and more. But there are certainly posts around, perhaps rather sadly, where trainees start under close supervision and always stay under close supervision. So the, what they're doing, for example, in ward rounds on the ward is always taking the notes and never talking with the patients, for example. And having an approach to training that focuses on the individual uh, is really obviously key to this. So this would be a, a illustrated by that top example of finding out very much as a supervisor where the trainee is at the moment and where they want to get to and working out what is most going to help them deliver, uh, achieve those aims. And rather different perhaps from a post where someone comes along and they get told what their duties are and what the expectations compared you know, from other trainees of where they've ended up at the end of this post, which is really driven by the post and not by the trainee. So through this personalized training, what we're looking at are things like individual feedback, tailored opportunities that support the choices of the trainee in terms of their career development, career options through flexible posts uh, and availability of subspecialties, flexibility in planning careers, and when necessary, appropriate support, whether that's for exams through the PSW at the deanery or whatever is required to best help the trainee achieve their desired objectives. Uh, so I'm going to stop talking there because I'm keen, as I say, to hand over to the trainees to talk a bit more about their perspective of training and where things are going. So first of all, uh, let me hand over to Luke from the PTC to talk about trainees' priorities and the work of the PTC. Good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, my name is Surgeon Lieutenant Commander Luke Baker. Uh, I'm a ST6 General Adult uh, Psychiatry Trainee. Uh, I've done all my training at SLAM, uh, but I'm spending my ST6 year back in a military job. Uh, and I'm talking to you today uh, as chair of the PTC. Uh, and it's really good uh, to be here as it is my first live webinar since becoming chair uh, a couple of months ago. Um, my Twitter handle is there and will uh, be appearing at the very end of this uh, presentation as well. Um, I'm very keen for people to engage with me publicly and, and privately um, and to also engage with the PTC through your local reps and through the email address um, that will be on your newsletters. Um, so please do feel free to use that uh, Twitter handle if there is anything that you want to speak to me about. Next slide, please. So I thought to start with, before I go into uh, think about our training, I wanted to do a bit of a plug for the PTC, and that's probably unexpected, to be honest, or hopefully is unexpected. Um, so the PTC is made up of about 40 trainees uh, from all regions and all the nations. Now, this is a picture from uh, last September. Um, when we all met in Belfast. Now, most of the people you see there are current PTC members, and some of those will be your local reps. Uh, some people have changed, and due to COVID, we weren't able to meet in person this year, so I don't have an update photo to share with you. But hopefully you can see there that there are a lot of trainees all around the UK ready to engage with you. Next slide, please. So what I thought I'd do on this slide is just lift, list briefly some of the things we're getting involved with, just so that you can get a flavour of that. Um, so we're involved with releasing some parental leave guidance, and that will hopefully come out over the next 10 months. Some mentoring guidance, uh, psychotherapy training survey. Some of you will remember completing that uh, about a year ago, uh, and I'm pleased to say that that report, I think, is now in its draft form and will hopefully come out quite soon, and we'll talk about psychotherapy in a bit. Some of you have requested a cost of training transparency document. I am delighted to say that is nearly ready. There is a draft, uh, and I am hoping to get that published with the college very soon. Uh, an IMG guide, uh, and more about that in a moment. We are representing you throughout the college uh, with exams, and I will talk about exams uh, in a moment time. The ePortfolio, uh, and again, I will come on to that uh, in a moment. We've supported trainees through COVID, whether that's through the ARCP processes or thinking about our training in general. The college have really listened to, to what we have advocated for uh, to try and get us through this really difficult period that I know some of you certainly have experienced, or most of us really have experienced. Uh, we've trialled a social media platform in Eastern, Northern Ireland, um, Seven, and we're looking to roll that out nationally. So that's an exciting project that may be coming to you soon. 
We've had our very first national CT welcome event in September, uh, and we will be continuing that for the February intake and having, for the very first time, a higher trainees national welcome event too. We will be having our second ever trainees conference. Uh, our secretary, Rosemary, is organising that, and that will sadly be virtual because we can't meet in person, but I really hope that will be a time for trainees to come together and network. And we're looking at developing some wellbeing podcasts and other wellbeing material. So please, my, my, my call today for trainees that are on this call, I'm sure there'll be lots of you there, please engage with us. You have your local reps, engage with them, engage with me. I can only advocate and represent you in the college and outside the college uh, if you let me know what you're thinking and what you want us to be doing. So please engage. Next slide, please. So uh, we do have a really exciting IMG guide that's been uh, developed through uh, the PTC and the training support group TSG. Um, there is going to be a very slight delay in its launch, I'm afraid. I was hoping uh, that we would be able to share the shiny copy with you today. Uh, it will be soon. And Sadia, after me, is going to talk a little bit more about this guide. Next slide, please. Right, moving on now to, to what we're talking about here and our, our kind of training and our, our education. When Chris uh, kindly asked me uh, to talk on this uh, a while ago. Um, I thought, well, what can I say? I'm not really an expert in, in, in medical education. And then I thought, well, I am a trainee, so I have lived experience of it. There'll be something I can add to this. Um, and I kind of then thought about, well, what, how do I view my training up until this point? And in many ways, it is a little bit like a conveyor belt. I, I'm gonna go through a study with you uh, in a moment, um, but I uh, have rare uh, for a trainee have completed, gone from CT1 to ST6 without any gaps. Uh, I'm in the minority for, for doing that. And trainees much more sensibly than me do take gaps at uh, some points. But when I, was view when I think about my training, there is very much that conveyor belt sense, the hoops, the ticks, the jumps, one has to complete to get through their training. Next slide, please. So what is it that we have to do uh, to become a consultant and to get our CCT at the end, which is often the goal, or should be the goal for, for most of us. Next slide. Well, one of the key things to do clearly is to follow the curriculum. Um, and I am really pleased that there will be a new curriculum coming out very soon, which I hope trainees will be able to engage with better than the current one that we have. Um, but essentially, if we don't follow that, we're not going to get through our training. So the curriculum is key and we need to make sure that we map our skills and our knowledge to that which the college produces. Next slide, please. We must complete the e-portfolio. Uh, many of us have lots of strong views about the e-portfolio. Uh, it's often people aren't particularly passive about it, to be honest, um, but we have to complete it. And that is the evidence that we have for the ARCP. Uh, and I'm pleased to say there's a lot of work ongoing at the minute um, to try and improve the e-portfolio, whether it is looking at kind of end of placement forms or whether it is looking at trying to make the e-portfolio slightly more user friendly. There are lots of uh, developmental things happening at the minute with it. Uh, so I'm hoping that you'll see changes over the next uh, academic year. Next slide, please. We must pass the ARCP. Uh, that is the annual requirement. That's kind of our tick in the box to say we've had a good year, we've met our requirements and we can continue through training. Next slide, please. We must sit and pass exams. Um, uh, exams can be very traumatic uh, for most of us. Uh, and I do just want to, to pause here a little bit um, and just uh, say well done from from, uh, from from me for for trainees that have sat these exams recently uh, under very difficult circumstances uh, and sitting them in very different ways to how I sat them uh, a few years ago. Um, I do want to say uh, that the college has been incredibly supportive, uh, has listened uh, and has engaged with the PTC uh, greatly with the exams and making sure that they're as trainee friendly as possible. I know the PTC knows that there have been problems. We're listening, we're advocating for you, and please do keep sharing your thoughts with us so that we can all make the exams better. Anyway, we must pass them. And I wish the, the candidates uh, tomorrow who find out about their CASC results uh, the best of luck. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, we have that CCT, the trophy, the uh, gold star, the, uh, we, we are awarded uh, uh, something that says that we have completed um, our training. Next slide, please. 
So that's the conveyor belt. That's kind of how, how I, I suppose, view my training. Not particularly individualized, not particularly personalized. Uh, I must do these things uh, or I'm not going to become a consultant and complete my training at the end. Next slide, please. So this was a report. Now I'm going to go through two reports. One, uh, Chris has already mentioned that I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the um, supported and value document. This is one, however, that I'm sure some of you won't have seen yet. Uh, and this came out this year and it was a big report. Uh, contains an awful lot of data actually from UCL trying to understand the career choices in psychiatry. Next slide, please. So this diagram here that I lifted from, from the report shows you a way that somebody could go from medical school to becoming a German adult psychiatrist uh, with no gaps. Um, and that is the quickest way that you can achieve it. Next slide, please. Many people, however, don't do that. Um, and this is just a summary of some of that data that is in, in the report. Um, so less than 15% of trainees progress through training as expected. I've said, I don't particularly like the term as expected, um, but what that, what that means um, is most trainees are doing other things, taking gaps or doing something else, which means they're not completing their training within, within the six years. Um, about 60% progress through core training, about half progress through specialty training without delays. But the biggest drop in trainee numbers is between CT3 and ST4. Um, and I think we know that I see that, but, you know, personally, lots of colleagues and friends do take a gap at that point. Um, but for a variety of, of reasons. Um, and interestingly, uh, th th those to that 14.8 percent of trainees progressing through training equals approximately 75 trainees a year completing the training program as expected. I wonder if that surprised you. I wonder if you thought uh, more trainees um, went through for the six years or maybe even you thought thought less less did that. But that's the current current data. And just, you know, we, we look at this, these data to try and think, well, how can we improve, uh, for example, retention in psychiatry? Um, and we're doing a careers kind of webinar for CT3s and, and CT, you know, people outside of training to see if we can improve the, the loss of trainees between between that gap. But it's also important, I think, for trainers. Uh, for trainers to see that the majority of their trainees aren't going to uh, do the six years in one go and that they may want some flexibility, they may want to do extra things and that that should be encouraged and be part of their training. Next slide, please. So I'm now just going to go on to briefly look at the supported and, and valued document uh, that came out in 2017. Next slide, please. So this was kind of the, the high level summary of things that trainees thought could improve their, their work and, and training. And this data was gathered through um, you know, vast data collection all around, again, the UK uh, through multiple focus groups. And you can see here, and again, I, I don't think this is unsurprising, you know, the headings here, facilities, clinical support, autonomy, IT, non-clinical support, the college doing, you know, being more supportive, rotors, training requirements and investment. I don't think anything there um, is surprising. And all of those things together are what trainees are saying would improve their training experience. Next slide, please. What are the core recommendations though? And I just wanna spend a, a minute looking at this. So supervision, it was found that nearly a quarter of trainees don't receive regular weekly supervision. Supervision, I find personally, and I, I very much advocate you know, within the college that all trainees have individual personalized supervision every week. Um, I certainly, for my supervision, go in with a list of things that I want to talk about. I see it very much as kind of my space to develop my skills and my understanding of, of what is happening. And I think it's really important that, that trainers allow trainees to use this space um, for how they uh, see fit. Uh, and also to make sure it is an hour and it's protected and it's hopefully regular uh, and people both sides can, can prepare for it. I think that's really important. Teaching is clearly important for our, our learning as well. And nearly a fifth a fifth of trainees said it wasn't protected, and that's a worry. Um, and psychotherapy, we've talked about a psychotherapy survey at the very beginning of this talk, and we'll be releasing um, your thoughts around psychotherapy and the difficulties um, that you have with psychotherapy. And I understand the difficulties that you've had, especially in this time of, of COVID as well. But you can see there that, that, that some trainees have not had protected time, and some trainees have found it difficult to be allocated with patients. Next slide, please. 
And these were the desired commitments. So one thing that, that trainees contact the PTC about on a fairly frequent basis is around the ARCP process. Um, Chris talked a little bit about it in his, his slides um, as well. And the ARCP process is should, in my view, and I, I, I very much strongly advocate for this, should be standardised across the UK. If I am a higher general adult trainee in Manchester, I should be held to the same standards um, as a trainee in London. Um, there are reports, there are times when trainees think that that's not the case, and I have currently gathered some data, which I will be sharing with the Dean very soon, to look at the standardisation of the ARCP process to make sure that it is there and it is standard for all trainees and for our training. Career autonomy, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, and enhanced junior doctor forums were seen as important, um, again, for, for our training. Next slide, please. So career autonomy, I suppose this is where we can start to see some more personalised aspects to our training in whether it's placement allocations. And Chris uh, talked about, again, the idea of locating um, kind of maybe uh, subspecialty jobs and making sure that each deanery has them and trainees can access them. Um, one of the ones clearly that comes up a lot is substance misuse. Um, personally, I had an interest in substance misuse and have done a year. Uh, as an ST doing that and that was important because that's what I wanted to do and luckily my trainers and those of the people that organised my training supported me in that um, to give me the skills and hopefully an endorsement um, next year in that. Study leave and encouraging trainers to make sure that they allow their trainees to take their study leave when they want to to make sure that they can achieve and go on the courses that they want to do. We all have different interests. Psychiatry is wonderful because we're a broad church uh, and it's important that trainees feel empowered to take their study leave uh, and to do what they want to do. In programme development opportunities, again, trainers allowing trainees to do that, whether that's the leadership and management fellowship of the college do, for example, there are lots of different ways and different types of things that trainees can do to develop some autonomy in their training programme. Out of programme activities, trainees do lots of fantastic, amazing things um, when they take some time out of training. Um, and there are lots of examples of that that people write about um, all of the time, which is always very interesting to, to see. And of course, less than full time working. Lots of trainees choose to do that for a variety of reasons. Uh, and it's important uh, for, from, from my view that the trainees are completely supported in that, that they get the support and any extra work that they need to make sure that that's successful and they get through their training uh, as well uh, as a full time trainee does um, as well. Next slide, please. So we talked about the conveyor belt, and I think in some ways core training, it's much easier to be on that conveyor belt. Um, you have to pass your exams um, and that complicates things and make, takes up a lot of time. But once you've got those exams and, and, and some of you will experience this, this feeling soon, you're gonna start having a bit more free time and a bit more uh, maybe or, therefore autonomy over what you wish to do. Next slide, please. Well, a great thing in uh, higher training, something that, that uh, I know the PTC is very keen to protect uh, and make sure that we keep this within psychiatry are the special interest sessions. And my friends and colleagues do a variety of different things to make their training personalized, whether that is through postgraduate training, doing an extra degree, whether it's through doing psychotherapy, med ed, leadership and management, QI projects, research, all going into a different subspecialty um, to understand more about that. We are incredibly lucky in psychiatry that we have this day and that it's a flexible day. And within reason, um, most trainers allow trainees to use it as they see fit. I think that's really important. It's a great thing, a great uh, privilege to have as a higher trainee in psychiatry. Um, uh, and that is certainly a way that we can use to personalize our training and something that as the PTC uh, and PTC chair, I'm very keen to make sure stays. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, I, it would be remiss of me not to comment on COVID uh, in more detail. COVID has clearly impacted us greatly in our work. Um, and here is just some data that I wanted to, to share with you. Um, the GMC National Training Survey um, has got some interesting data on their website, and I encourage you to, to go and have a look at that if you're interested in, in how it's impacting training across, across the medical specialties. Um, but psychiatry trainees reported a heavier workload than many with 52% uh, saying that it's increased. Um, many of you, uh, and, and thank you for doing this, completed the trainee COVID survey that we sent out a few months ago. 
And that showed that the majority of you have had concerns about training and progression. You've commented that there are some positive influences, so technology, being able to demonstrate new skills and different ways of team working and improved team working. But you've also commented on the negative influences to training. So whether that's reduced opportunities, the impact it's had on yourself, poor communication and the difficulties of remote working and kind of the loss of usual support. This has greatly impacted on our, our, our training. There's no doubt, no doubt about it. And I know the PTC and the college will continue to work together as we're in this second wave and, and who knows what's going to happen um, next year. But I can assure you that the PTC and college will be working really closely together to make sure that the effect of COVID is as minimal as possible um, and that we can be as supportive as possible to, for you as you complete your training. Next slide, please. That's it from me. Thank you for listening. My Twitter handle is there. As I said um, at the start, I really want to engage with you more this year. I want this to be a really productive uh, year for the PTC. So please do uh, engage with your local reps, engage with me, engage through the college channels. Um, and thank you very much for listening. So uh, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Sadia. Sadia is our IMG rep on the PTC. Uh, and there she is. Thank you, Sadia. Over to you. Thanks, Luke. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sadia Alvi. I'm SD5 General Adult Psychiatry, working in South Yorkshire. And I'm also IMD's representative to Royal College of Psychiatry's PTC. I am executive member of Training Support Group and also Transculture Special Interest Group. Today, I'm talking to you as my IMG rep role. I'm going to talk about personalized training and individualized approach and how it's going to help international medical graduates and to help with differential entertainment. I would like to start my talk with Carl Sagan's quote that says, you have to know the past to understand the present. And this is a very common strategy which we use in everyday life while making management plan for our patients. We try to get as many background information as possible. In our daily life, making friends in our social circle, we try to get as much information as possible. And if we really want to know an IMG and want to understand them, we have to know their background. We have to take IMG as an individual we have to take them as a person, as a whole. And that would then define their specific needs and challenges, which are unique and specific and would differ from person to person. I'm going to quote some examples regarding their personal circumstances. Please don't generalize it and don't personalize it. For example, almost all I am is have to go through a difficult procedure of visas. It's not as simple as I just said that every IMG has to go back to their host country to apply for visa. And it's not just for themselves. It's if they want to apply for their family, they have to apply individually for each family member. There's visa fees for individual family member. And there is also NHS surcharge, which they have to pay individually. And who knows, by doing all that, they are financially drained. At the same time, they are managing their day-to-day -day life, accommodation, traveling, transport, medical assistant, and so on. No wonder why many IMGs opt for non-training post to fund all these expenses. And at the same time, if they have to fund the exams, that's an additional cost. And we are all aware IMRC psych exams are not cheaper. They range from 500 to 1,000. And if they have to attend some courses, it might be more. Now, if we just... Consider an IMG arriving in UK as single or 
their family and social support network is already broken. They are trying to build a new life from scratch. Social isolation itself kills. And who knows if they have a young family to look after. No wonder why many female doctors, they take career break, they go part time or they go. They take longer career breaks to look after their young families. While an ING is dealing with all these things in their personal life, they are accommodating in a new healthcare system. They have to keep up with GMC good medical practice. They are learning about patient-centered approach on mentality, which they are not used to. IMGs are naive to Mental Health Act, Mental Capacity Act, and they might need intense induction for these things. While an IMG is trying to adjust between their personal life and at the same time their professional life clock is ticking they have to do the exams paper a in year one paper b in year two cask in year three and it's done who knows an img might need to improve their communication skills they might need to learn local dialects they might need to work on their theory all these needs practice and time they might need more guidance for exams because they are new to the system. They might need more guidance with ERCP. So there is a lot which an IMG is going through and the capability to deal with all these challenges would differ from person to person. Some might adjust in a couple of months. Some might take a couple of years. Some might not need it at all especially if they have completed their foundation year training here or they have worked in non-training course, they might get on very quickly. But is it good enough to just talk about IMG's needs and challenges? It's not. Just imagine if we keep on nagging someone for their negatives, in itself, it will give them, bring their morale down. They might think, I am weak. I'm not able to do anything. Secondly, with this approach, there is stigma attached to it. No one would like to have a title of a struggling training. So we really need to opt for a balanced approach. So we have to acknowledge their strengths. IMGs are highly qualified. They might have degrees, postgraduate qualification, MD, or they have PhD. They might have a lot of research experience. IMGs are rich in clinical experience, and they have very good skill to manage patients with limited resources. IMGs are my, bi or multilingual. They have lots of cultural values. I would like to point that now is third or fourth generation of BAME residing in UK at this moment. Their number, their population has increased and so has the number of patients have increased. And I was just reading recently Catherine Wolf's article, which says that 40% of the medical students currently in UK medical schools are from BAME background. Doesn't it indicate a need for local graduates to learn about their colleagues' cultural values. There is a lot to learn from IMG's clinical experience, and that would generate a culture of mutual learning. That is when an IMG would feel valued. When IMG's strengths are not acknowledged and their needs are not met the way it should, it has resulted simply in IMG's failure. Next slide, please. Which we have given a name differential attainment. Let's see some of the facts and figures. Total percentage of IMG's in psychiatry is about 35 to 40%, but disproportionate spread. 
more than 80% are in non-consultant grade fours, and they are underrepresented at consultant level. IMGs in psychiatry are more likely to fail summative and formative exams. These are some past years from 2019. Paper A, UK graduates working in UK, 65.3%. Overseas graduates in training post 20.4%. Overseas graduates in non-training post 41.9%. CASP 2019 first attempt candidates, UK graduates 88.5%. Overseas graduates in training post 31.8%. And overseas graduates in non-training post 38.1%. Pass rate in different ethnic groups, whites 78.5%, total non-white doctors 29.6%. And when we adjusted for the UK graduates, it rose up to 74.7%. Country-wise, first attempt only, UK graduates 86%. Indian subcontinent 30.1%, Central Africa 20.7%. Courtesy from ETC meeting, I have got the September 2019 CASC results. It says that overall pass rate is the highest, is 67%. Last year it was 64%. It was reported that differential attainment has improved, but there is still significant difference. Previously it used to be 40% and this year it's 30%. Let's look at some of the GMC research. This is the Warwick University report that was published for GMC February 2009. Areas of concerns identified at that time for IMGs were lack of relevant information about legal, ethical, and professional standards, variable level of training and support, specifically in the areas of communication and ethical decision making, Isolation in non-training posts. The key difference identified between non-UK qualifiers and UK qualifiers was that in UK, it's more individual autonomy and shared decision making, while more paternalized approach in non-UK qualifiers. So recommendation given at that time were Development of a web-based portal for ethics information prior to registration for non-UK qualified doctors. Development of specific resources, including information about the cultural context of UK professional regulatory framework. Provision of appropriate formal induction to include specific consideration of legal, ethical, and social context of healthcare in the UK and mentorship schemes especially for all non-UK qualified doctors during the first two years of employment. Now we all know that these uh, recommendations have not been implicated across the country, especially mentorship schemes. Mr. Chakravarti Gananchi's head of Welcome to UK Practice GMC. In her recent article, she acknowledged this Warwick University report and says that this, this is a nice piece of work and it formed the basis of GMC Welcome to UK Practice Workshop. And she also describes how IMG doctors are finding these workshops helpful. Then other report, Fair Pathway Report from 2016. Findings from qualitative research UK BME and IMG compared to white peers. And the three main risks identified were relationships with seniors crucial to learning, but these were more problematic for BME, UK graduates, and IMGs. Number two, perceived bias in recruitment and assessment. Number three, lack of autonomy about geographical location of work, separation from personal support network, leading to poor work-life balance compounded the risk. This is another research published in November 2019, supporting successful medical training for black and minority ethnic groups. 
GMC identified three main factors and success factors identified by BAME medical students. In the first group, it says the working and learning environment. A BAME student thinks value diversity and take the learner as an individual. When we read this report in detail, it also says that rather than taking a BAME's diversity as a problem in learning, it should be taken as their positive point and take them as individual who supports learning, inspirational senior, supportive trainers, peer support, what supports learning, work arrangements, maximizing learning, career clarity, navigating exams, motivation and drive. So by now we have enough evidence that IMGs and BIM are struggling. There's a lot to do and we have talked about it quite a lot. And this is the time to come up with some solutions and act on that. So in my view, what an IMG should do, be proactive. You should be able to identify your needs and your strengths. You are in charge of your training. It's your training, it's your time to learn. Get your supervisors and TPDs on board. They are supposed to provide you the support you need. What should the system do? It's the time to opt for training-centered approach. As I have said earlier, everyone is different. Everyone has different abilities to cope with the circumstances, to cope with learning. So it should be a trainee-centered approach. One shoe size doesn't fit all. A trainee should sit with their trainer and have a focused PDP around their needs and their goals. What should system do? Health Education England, College, Deanries, Local Trust, or GMC, wherever these points apply, it should be assured support structure and safe psychological spaces are in, sp in place to facilitate conversation and develop supportive bond between a trainee and a trainer. Health education in here. Make arrangement for trainers to, to support IMG and BM trainees. There is a need to train the trainer for individualized, culturally competent approach. They should be able to identify their needs and strengths and to make arrangements accordingly. Now these arrangements might include need for intense induction, especially around medical legal issues, exam guidance, provision of resources, schedule their, their work schedule, reschedule it and to create some space to practice communication skills and theory. Believe in a training and encourage to achieve their goals. Be honest to provide the feedback. This is a gold standard which will bring the maximum out of our training. Appoint IMG BM champions or mentors wherever needed and GMC to continue to assert the standards. I would like to talk about IMG guide, which was PTC and TSG joint effort. I started it as PTC rep, uh, IMG rep last year, and differential attainment was a major issue for a long time. So we come up with the plan to write an IMG guide it has basically two portions. Five chapters are psychiatry specific. And there are five more chapters, which will be applicable for all other specialty, inclusive of psychiatry. So we have tried to provide information along with useful links so that IMG can go to these links and get the information 
according to their needs. Psychiatry specific chapters include structure of psychiatric services in UK, portal of entry and career pathways, application process to core and higher training for IMGs, examination guide, MRC psych, key terms used in psychiatry. We felt that IMGs need to be more aware of the system and services before they arrive in UK, or at least in their early years of work in the country. More general chapters include introduction to NHS, introduction to Mental Health Act, introduction to Mental Capacity Act, visa processes, cultural induction into living in UK for IMGs. This guide was supposed to be okay, but due to some technical issues, uh, we are expecting it shortly, it will be out soon. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sadia. And Luke, that's great. I think you're absolutely right that there is a kind of wealth of evidence about differential attainment there. And while there's certainly room for a kind of top-down approach, I'm very much uh, very keen that the day-to-day -day experience of our international graduates is perhaps rather different from how it's been, that we have a more welcoming approach and is more attuned to their specific needs from their kind of individual approach. So thank you. And thank you, Luke, uh, for that. Um, so we've got a little bit of time for questions. We're coming up to five o'clock, so obviously I'll understand if people are leaving, but we've been given permission to run over by five minutes or so. Uh, I don't know, while Sadi has been speaking, Luke, have you had an eye on the question and answers that are coming in at all? You put me on the spot, Chris. <clears throat> I, I, let me take one. Uh, <laughs> there's a slightly complicated one. I hope I've answered about someone working in Ireland, which is... Uh, potentially affected by Brexit if you're an EU citizen, but not if you're an Irish national. Uh, there's a question about the new curriculum I might give to you, Luke, perhaps one about someone who's shielding as well. Uh, shall I answer that or would one of you like to? They're talking about how training is affected by shielding. Shall I take the one about the curriculum, Chris? Our Tell us a little bit about the curriculum and what trainees can expect in terms of any, I guess, particularly any sudden changes, but uh, what, yeah, just a bit more about that. Okay, so uh, the curriculum uh, has been ongoing by Dr. John Russell. He's done an awful lot of work uh, on the curriculum and any of you that were at Congress at the Excel Centre um, last year, um, would have seen him going round with his t-shirt on about the new curriculum and the tree image that he has. He was really promoting it there. And he's done a, a really, I'm gonna use a tree analogy here, a root and branch review, I guess, of uh, the curriculum. Um, it is uh, progressed a long way now. If you Google and look on the college website for the curriculum 2021, you'll see an awful lot um, in there. And I think it's about trying, I mean, the, the, the the idea of it was that for those of you that ever looked at our previous curriculum, um, it was not a particularly nice document to engage with. Uh, it was difficult. Um, and I wonder if any trainees really ever used it properly. So I think the idea is for this curriculum to actually be used, um, for it to be very clear how you can um, uh, evidence that you've achieved certain aspects of the curriculum, and I suppose to bring it up to kind of modern modern times. So that's a little bit about the, the, the direction. And if you Google it, uh, you'll see a bit uh, on it, but hopefully it's going to come out next year. So that's the curriculum, Chris. Fantastic. Uh, Sadia, I'll ask you a question in a moment about um, resources for international doctors, perhaps coming back into training, but just to not put you on the spot straight away, let me answer the question about shielding. Um, so there's a question from a trainee who's been shielding um, since the start of the pandemic and how that might affect their training. So I think uh, to some extent, we're quite fortunate potentially in psychiatry in that a lot of fairly normal work can continue while people are shielding. So I've had a trainee myself who's been shielding for a lot, uh, well, since the pandemic uh, and has managed outpatient clinics uh, absolutely fine. We've had supervision, we've done work with place assessments and so on. That's going to reach a bit of a crunch point at some point because there'll be some aspects of the 
uh, training curriculum that will be very difficult to do when training. So some of the matters about acute inpatient care, uh, not necessarily out of hours as such, because there's flexibility in the curriculum to do out of hours equivalents, but certainly that kind of acute aspect of psychiatry and obviously the physical health care is going to be more difficult to us. Um, a challenge more for other specialties that will certainly affect our trainees. I guess at the moment we're seeing how things uh, develop in terms of vaccine and clinical services. Certainly so far we've been fairly encouraged that, for example, with ARCPs, trainees have got through them in pretty similar manner to previous years. So we don't think, we think people are being able to continue with training, certainly at the moment. Uh, and we're kind of closely watching this space. So I think for the moment, do what you can while you're shielding. Uh, be aware that this is very much a subject for discussion, certainly within um, Health Education England and the other bodies involved in education. Uh, and it's, it's partly a, a kind of measure of how the pandemic goes uh, and how we adjust our training. So Sadi, if I can hand over to you. So if someone was an international graduate looking to enter training, what kind of resources might you point them towards? What about, sorry, resources about, I, I was just reading this question about mental health act, actually, section ah. 12 training and Maudsley. So I was just trying to type that, uh, you know, every trust has their own mental health act teams and offices, and they should be contacting them if they are working there. And you the duration for uh, any section status. These are legal things and these are permanent. It can't be changeable from trust to trust. Section two duration, if it's 28 days, it's 28. Section three, if it's three uh, six months, it's six months. So you better be contacting the Mental Health Act office within that trust if you have any doubts. And if you if you had an international doctor looking to either enter or re-enter training, so obviously we've got our excellent guides that will be hopefully coming out yeah. shortly. Where, where could people go at, at the moment? Are there other resources that people could look at? Um, there are many, you know, online things for PLAB, PLAB resources are available if they want to go. Many private organizations are doing on their own. And they are, I mean, they're from different countries, they're different organizations, they can join them and get the proper information from them. And that kind of information is, it's available on RC Psych website as well. You know, if you want to join co-training, what is the procedure? If you want to go for high training, how can you enter in the high training? Excellent. So there's a lot on the college website and I guess the deanery websites. And I think people are very happy to be contacted, either current trainees or uh, heads of school in the region. People are interested in training yeah. uh, to talk to anyone interested. So that would, I would consider a fairly uh, important part of my job. Great, so we have overrun. I think we should probably draw to a uh, close. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry, may I just add one thing, just because I do see one question in the Q&A yeah. guide about uh, the IMG guide and how will people know when it's released. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, I will tweet about it as soon as it's released. So there's a plug. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, if you don't want to follow me on Twitter, um, it will appear um, through the PTC Oops. account. I will make sure that it um, goes on the uh, RC Psych training account. So, so follow that one um, and you'll see it that way. Um, so we will advertise it as soon as it's released. Fantastic. Sorry, I haven't been able to get to all the questions for people who joined us, but uh, thank you for being here over the last hour. And as I say, great to have um, a, tra a webinar about training uh, led very much by our trainees here. Uh, so thank you. And I think we'll finish, finish there. Thank you. Thank you. All. Good night. Good night.